Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I think we're ready to get started. My name is Justin Stern. I'm a second year PhD student here at the GSD. And I am joined uh, at the podium by my colleagues, Adam Tanaka and Marianne Potvin. And we are the co-chairs for this week's events. On behalf of the entire doctoral program in architecture, landscape architecture, and urban planning, we would like to welcome you to the keynote lecture for the ninth installment of Cape Ridge Talks, the annual spring conference organized by our department. In the interest of time, we will save our thank yous for tomorrow morning, and there are many thank yous. But I do want to extend our, our appreciation uh, to the director of our program, Erica Naginski, for her generous support throughout the planning of this event. Thank you, Erica. This year's conference is entitled Inscriptions of Power, Spaces, Institutions, and Crisis. Our primary question is, how is institutional power manifested in the built environment, and how does it shape modes of academic discourse and professional practice? Tonight and tomorrow, we will explore some of the complex ways in which space has been imagined, as well as actualized by the design disciplines and different institutional entities. We have three very exciting sessions tomorrow. The first, entitled The Disciplinary Expectations of Scale, includes presentations by Eve Blau, Mark Jarzenbeck, Preston Scott Cohen, and Vittoria De Palma, and will be moderated by Dean Mostafavi. It will be in Piper from 9.30 to 12.30 PM. And our second panel, The Spaces of Institutions, features presentations by Elihu Rubin, David Theodore, Jesus Escobar, and Brian Goldstein, and will be moderated by Jana Cephas. That will be from 1.30 to 3.45, also in Piper. And we will conclude the day tomorrow with a roundtable discussion featuring Reinhold Martin and Erica Naginski in conversation. We warmly well invite you to join us in Piper tomorrow. Before moving on to the lecture, we feel the need to acknowledge the tragic events that took place at Garasa University in Kenya today, where nearly 150 people, students, professors, administrators, and support staff were senselessly murdered. While this puts a dark cloud on the day, it also reminds us of the significance of the university as a symbolic institution and a site of crucial intellectual exchange. To introduce Reinhold Martin, I would like to invite to the podium Edward Eigen, Associate Professor of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the GSD. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish to thank the um, organizers, and in some way in particular, Adam Tanaka, who I met on his first day as an undergraduate and have been following uh, with much admiration since. But I want to thank the organizers for, of Cambridge, Turk, uh, Cambridge Talks for affording me the honor of introducing tonight's keynote speaker, uh, Reinhold Martin, uh, professor of architecture in the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University, where he directs the Temple Hoyenbuehl Center for the Study of American Architecture. Uh, he's also a co-founder of, uh, uh, founding co-editor of Gray Room, uh, in which our own Antoine Picon uh, published um, an essay on anxious landscapes, which appeared in the journal's inaugural issue in the autumn of 2000 now. I will turn in very brief order, I promise, to the problem of introductions, or what the uh, Cambridge School historian Quinton Skinner in his recent study of forensics calls failed beginnings. But first, a preliminary comment on the discursive setting or heading implied by the title of this edition of Cambridge Talks, Inscriptions of Power. Inscription, the act and fact of it, the material reality and the asymmetric moral predicament it creates between writers and readers, precisely and mutually constituting them, gains added, if not perhaps also local significance with a talk delivered this very afternoon by the sociologist of the text, Roger Chartier, as part of the series, Harvard Library, Strategic Conversations. The subject, consuming the written word. The talk itself was followed by an edible book festival. Now, about this, I can say coincident, but not necessarily correlate to the recent neurological turn in architectural studies, I would argue a dyspeptic one. The renewed interest in foodways and gastronomy at least brings to mind Nietzsche's sense of the difficulty of getting, or rather keeping things down. The German mind, he says, is the case of indigestion. It never is done with anything. Thus, in his Inscription and Erasure of 2005, Chartier addresses in the most elegant terms the need to overcome the desire for inscription and the anxiety it produces. 
The written text is another anxious landscape, given to its own forms of rust and ruin, as well as persistence and imperishability. Chartier juxtaposes the fear of obliteration that obsessed the societies of early modern Europe, an anxiety quelled by preserving, quote, written traces of the past, remembrances of the dead, glory of the living, and texts of all kinds that, are now, um, that were now supposed to disappear. But the very success of this project threatened its own form of self-obliteration, the accumulated weight of authority. He says, the excess of writing piled up useless texts and sifted, stifled uh, 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 thought beneath the weight of accumulating discourse, creating a peril no less ominous than a threat of disappearance. Obliteration, though dreaded, was therefore necessary, just as oblivion uh, is a condition of memory, thus inscription and erasure. But that said, it is not inscription that gives me pause, and I use the term here advisedly, um, even as Cambridge talks are set to begin. It is the curious appearance of a semicolon in some of the publicity for the conference, it is replaced in others by a colon, and I'm referring to this usage here, and I refer you to the uh, poster that's outside, um, that either separates or connects power to spaces, institutions, and crisis that, as I said, gives me pause and raises some questions in my mind. Evidently, this substitution or choice, preliminarily for a semicolon, uh, for a colon that is, uh, semicolon, was a matter of design, some sort of proleptic response to the stated question, how does space bear the mark of bureaucratic networks, typological uh, assumptions, lived experiences? I will leave it entirely to Reinhold Martin, who is uniquely competent in this regard, and in several others, to address the problem of bureaucratic networks. As for typological assumptions, I assume this refers to the phenomena of punctuation itself. According to the Keeble College Oxford paleographer um, M.B. Uh, Parks in his masterwork, Pause and Effect, Punctuation in the West of 1993, the primary function of punctuation is to, quote, resolve structural uncertainties in a text and to signal a nuance of semantic significance which might otherwise not be conveyed at all. It's a medium of communication, though perhaps not explicitly in the sense of medium in which um, right, uh, Martin refers to it. Lived experience, the other stated term here, is of course a part of this. Punctuation in part serves to introduce pauses for the purpose of breath into the reading of texts originally understood as this transcription of spoken words. But in a more immediate sense, Park writes that punctuation, quote, encourages readers to import to the process of interpretation elements of their own wider behavioral experience. This is what he calls the pragmatics of the text, and I would argue is in line with the um, epigraph from Henri Lefebvre, which uh, appears in your uh, conference proceedings. In any case, upper or lower, here, of course, is not the place to get into specifics. But still, why, why the semicolon? Because the, because the colon was already employed to separate Cambridge talks from inscription of power, was this a Giulio Romano-like play of aperiodic symmetries? He was practicing, as it happens, precisely when the art of punctuation was being conventionalized. Was it uh, a fear of too sharp a distinction between inscriptions of power and spaces, institutions, and crises? And by the way, and here I use a parenthesis, which were amongst the six original punctuation marks, including indicating medial pauses and other forms of textual incision and dissection. Um, but rather uh, is a sense of a comma or that of a clausula or a clause or a phrase that together form a sentence, the term of which is marked by a period or punctum. But as I was saying, now doubly parenthetically, why just crisis? Crisis? Well, either our work is mostly done and we have settled upon, if not reconciled ourselves to the right crisis to be anxious about, or we have much work to do dealing with but one crisis at a time, because in this school we're always speaking about crises in the plural, and we love them fondly. Well, let me say this. Punctuation in the most general sense has to do with collocation, and this comes from the Latin origin to kind of co-locate, to place things side by side, which seems to me an eminently architectural act and feature. Indeed, the spatial and sensible arrangement of meaningful signs, this is the act of collocation. 
Collocation early, if not perhaps originally, had this architectural implication. The Frenchman Pierre de la Rame, known to us as uh, Petrus Ramus, built on the edifice, as he called it, of the art of punctuation elaborated by the Lyon printer Etienne Dolet in his Grammaire Francaise of 1562, where he insisted not only on the syllogistic essence of collocation, the ordering of ideas, but as his latter day student Walter Ong has argued, on the quote, drive toward thinking of thought itself in terms of spatial models apprehended by sight. With that signal word, apprehension, which is a form of anxiety all its own, let me bring this to a conclusion. And especially in as much as uh, what I meant to offer is an, what I was meant to offer is an introduction, a wrapping up, or what Dole called the period, a comprehension of words with it, with, uh, while evoking its Latin equivalent catalepsis, an impulse or active seizure, or as Glenn P. Norton writes, uh, uh, directed at ideas through the concrete medium of words. Punctuation is the form and structure of comprehension, of apprehension, of deduction. It liberates the meaning of the sentence. The sentence itself might sound now more like something that is handed down by statute, a term or expression of judgment, something to be served. What I have too briefly or overindulgently discoursed upon is not so much a symptom of power relations, but what grammarians and rhetors would have considered questions of energia, of force or energy, or the way in which language actuates a reader's response, questions of inscription and erasure. Brevity is the soul of wit, or so says Polonius in his report on the, quote, true madness of Hamlet, which he nonetheless cannot self regarding, he cannot help but self regardingly embellish with foolish gestures of his own making. Um, in all, as Skinner notes, a failed beginning is one marked by drawing unnecessary attention to one's own use of language. The point, as it were, the punctum, as Cicero himself, a victim of political violence, would have it, is to briefly lay out what matters are going to be explained. And that, I, sh I imagine, is the service of a well-delivered introduction. So here I introduce you to you uh, Reinhold Martin, architect, a scholar, a writer, and perhaps most conspicuously, the social conscience of our field. Indeed, a field which he early recognized to be global in its contours and pitfalls. The author, uh, the generation defining the organization complex, uh, architecture, media, and corporate space, and Utopia's Ghost. He is currently working on a history of the 19th century American university as a media complex, uh, a work which I very uh, keenly anticipate. So please join me in employing the punctus admirativus, or the punctuation point, uh, whilst we welcome to the podium uh, Reinhold Martin. Thank you, Ed. Come back up here. We should just do this together, no? It'll be fun. Uh, well, in, in many ways, this is for my friends. Uh, and and uh, as was well said, um, in solidarity with our colleagues in Kenya. So um, to thank, first of all, uh, Ed, from whom I always learn a great deal, uh, uh, even punctually in this case, um, and Erica for her, uh, for the dialogue that continues, begins now and, and, and I think continues through tomorrow. Uh, and, and of course to Adam, Justin, and Marianne for bringing us all here uh, this evening. Well, it is indeed a, a great pleasure um, uh, and an honor to be invited to address uh, this ninth edition uh, of the Cambridge Talks. I, I hope that the direct relevance of my remarks to the questions that, again, Ed elaborated uh, so well uh, that were posed by the conference will quickly become clear. Uh, and, and in that sense, I'm going to try not to detain you for too long. Uh, there are things to do. Um, but uh, I do ask you to bear with me uh, through uh, a few steps. Um, in that spirit and in honor of the conference title, uh, um, I begin with a quotation. Last Thursday, he walked to Cambridge, uh, and with some tremor, he set off to be on the spot <clears throat> at 6 in the morning, uh, and uh, since which I have heard through others, he passed a very good examination. 
He came home on Saturday, pleased to find he was admitted without being admonished to study, as was the case with many. This, as you can see, was Ruth Emerson, the mother of Ralph Waldo Emerson, writing on September 1st, 1817, to her sister-in-law, Mary Moody Emerson, who was a surrogate parent and teacher to the young poet philosopher. His mother describes the ordeal of the college entrance examination. As she reports, young Emerson passed the exam and was admitted to Harvard College, uh, which by then, 1817, uh, was also referred to, with no small exaggeration, as Harvard University. Now, 20 years prior, in 1797, and around 100 miles away, a 15-year-old Daniel uh, Webster traveled alone to Hanover, New Hampshire, from his hometown in Salisbury. Upon arrival, he proceeded to a house across the street from Dartmouth Hall, the main and indeed at that time only building uh, on the grounds of Dartmouth College. There he stood before his examiners in a new suit that a neighbor had made for the occasion, the blue dye of which had begun to run in the day's rain, and announced, this is Webster, quote, thus you see me as I am, if not entitled to your approbation, at least to your sympathy. The oral examination uh, tested young Webster's ability to translate English into Latin, to recite uh, from Virgil, Cicero, and the Greek Testament, and to perform basic arithmetic. He passed, barely. In Discipline and Punish of 1975, a text that has justly influenced several generations of architectural scholarship with its treatment of Der Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, Michel Foucault observed uh, that, quote, the examination combines the techniques of an observing hierarchy uh, and those uh, of normalizing judgment. In it are combined the ceremony of power and the form of, of the experiment, the deployment of force and the establishment of truth. This is what Foucault meant uh, in conjoining power with knowledge, a couplet that we recognize at work as young Webster, his wet suit, dripping blue, presents himself before his examiners for observation and judgment. Thus you see me as I am. The announcement for this uh, conference begins with an epigraph uh, from Henri Lefebvre that associates power with the organization of space. Foucault's treatment of the panopticon and of the panoptic gaze to which young Webster submitted is certainly on that order. However, Foucault's broader uh, notion of the dispositif or the dispositive or the apparatus uh, <clears throat> he calls it the apparatus of the carceral, of which the panopticon is merely an idealized diagram, complicates uh, things a bit. The apparatus in question in, in, in this uh, aspect of Foucault, uh, the, the, the Deleuzean term is assemblage, we can also say complex. Uh, this apparatus connects space with institutions deriving from the state, like prisons, uh, or in some cases from the church, uh, like colleges. Um, as well as with the social institution of the family. Uh, oops. Colleges, see, you know that one, right? Uh, with, so, and, and as well as the social institutions of the family, the functioning of, with, of which, for both Emerson uh, and Webster, uh, had made their education possible. In the early American Republic, as in Foucault's Europe, but differently, uh, the family, the point of entry into, the, uh, into college was newly subject to governmental practices mirrored by educational ones, like the meticulous documentation that made of every examination and every student a case to be counted and measured against others, as Webster was. To do so, social, political, and cultural bodies combined into infrastructural complexes to form the material procedural substrate from which power and knowledge emerged and circulated, bound together by what Foucault called the deployment of force and the establishment of truth. The modern research university and its predecessor, the residential college, was one such body. This evening, to address the concerns of the conference, I have assembled four brief uh, nested loops uh, that show the workings of power knowledge in and through, the college, through college and university infrastructures uh, in the 19th and early 20th, American, uh, 20th century American context. 
Though architecture appears periodically, I warn you that this is not a history of architecture. I've only gathered pieces of history that bear certain architectural characteristics. Think of this then as doing history with architecture and, if you will, doing theory with history. But I must explain that by architecture, I mean a complex of material and discursive infrastructures or, or technical media with irreducibly aesthetic, social, and technological properties and consequences. By infrastructure, I mean that which repeats. Infrastructure is what repeats. Institutions within institutions, like exams, lectures, seminars, but also technical systems, de systems defined by repetition, like the electric light that comes on every night with the flip of a switch. My focus on hardware is sympathetic with a subset of the new materialisms, as they're sometimes called, that have circulated widely in North America and in Europe, um, some of which were associated, uh, for example, with the name of Bruno Latour, but with two notable differences that I would like, I want to mark. One, that I propose going back to the basics of power knowledge with Foucault. Uh, and two, that when I say material, materialism, or technical media, I want you also to hear means of production. And with it, all of the struggles that, th that this expression elicits. Foucault said it straightforwardly enough. Power produces. So to simplify, Running in the background of my presentation will be an operating system that combines, without reconciling them, the programming language known as Foucault with the programming language known as Marx. I combine these programming languages on the motherboard of what is known as media history. Uh, which, there's got to be hardware there, right? Uh, which some have renamed the study of cultural techniques. And we can talk about that later if, you, if you'd like. Although I will not cite its canon directly, I want to be clear that by, by this I do not mean a historical critique of mass media as elaborated so fruitfully by the Frankfurt School. Nor do I mean to analogize architecture with visual media. I mean instead, to quote from the organizational complex, to construe architecture rather literally as one among many media. This avowedly architectural formulation is somewhat paradoxically, I think, what enables us to do history with architecture, provided we recognize the deeply intermedial or relational character of our objects of study and their processes. All right, uh, what is a university then? It is a media system. To explain, here is the uh, professor of philology. No, nope, not that one. No. <coughs> Professor of Philology, Friedrich Nietzsche, age 27, in the last of five lectures delivered before the Öffentliche Akademische Gesellschaft or Public Academy at the University of Basel in 1872. This is the university. One speaking mouth with many ears and half as many uh, writing hands. There you have to all appear appearances the external academic apparatus, the university, university education machine in action. Now, in Nietzsche's university, a newfound zone of academic freedom separated professor uh, from audience, but as, but as he pointedly remarked to his European listeners, standing behind it all, behind it all, as at some modest distance, as he said, was the state. To remind all concerned, quote, that it, it is the aim, the state is the aim, the goal, the be all and end all of this curious speaking and hearing procedure. That's Nietzsche. Nietzsche and his extramural audience were bound together by a continental university system that reflected the Prussian reforms begun around 1810, in which universities became knowledge-seeking instruments of the new nation states, reorganized around the kind of primary research the young philologist was doing in Basel as he prepared to publish his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, which was published in 1872. But even in translation, we can hear the indignation in Nietzsche's voice at what he took to be servitude uh, masked as freedom, administered at a distance by feeble, sycoph sycophantic bureaucrats, guardians of a national culture dedicated to nothing more than their and its self-preservation. Now, in the United States, the authority that stood at a modest distance from the speaking, listening, and writing machine of the university in the, in the, uh, in the 19th century was less the state than the church, uh, and, and behind that, industrial capital. <laughs> 
In the 1870s, as Nietzsche wrote, the small denominational colleges founded during the American colonial period began rapidly expanding into large research universities, uh, lar uh, largely on the German model, but not exclusively, I should say. Although federal, state, and municipal bodies were central in establishing and governing the land-grant universities and, and administering uh, educational legitimacy, it was first the church, or rather this or that Protestant denomination with ties to business that watched from a modest distance over the research university as ears and hands recorded spoken words in the new lecture halls and seminar rooms built on religious foundations. I keep doing this, wrong button. Hardware. Uh, thus, in 1904, we find William Rainey Harper, uh, then president of the University of Chicago, issuing a simple command in a lecture to students. He says, the sum and substance of the Christian faith is found in two words, follow me. Now, at the University of Chicago, circa 1904, follow me meant, in essence, listen, take notes, read and exercise practical religious and moral judgment in the conduct of everyday affairs. For Harper and many, but not all of his faculty, all of whom were expected to participate in weekly chapel, uh, this was perfectly compatible with scientific rationality. Despite the university's Baptist origins and the huge sums donated by the country's wealthiest Baptist, John D. Rockefeller, um, and although Henry Ives Cobb's master plan included uh, a centrally located Gothic revival chapel, none was built during the first three decades at the, of the University of Chicago's existence. It was only in 1910, having already given approximately $25 million to the university, uh, that Rockefeller made a final gift of $10 million. Not bad, huh? Um, 1910. Uh, $10 million, of which he stipulated that at least $1.5 million be used for the construction and furnishing of a university chapel. That chapel was ultimately designed by the New York-based architect Bertram Governor Goodhue and was completed uh, following Goodhue's sudden death uh, by the successor firm of Myers, Murray, and Phillip in 1928. As it happens, in 1926, uh, while, uh, while this uh, building was uh, being designed, uh, Floyd R. Watson, a professor of physics at the University of Illinois Urbana who had gained prominence in the new field of acoustic science, together with his colleague from the architecture department, James White, uh, here we have Watson, uh, were engaged by the University of Chicago to study the acoustical treatment of the chapel interior proposed by the Goodhue firm. Now, at this point, the most significant acoustic issue for churches, auditoria, and lecture halls was the overlap of sounds and blending of words due to reverberation. To minimize this, the consultants, Watson and White, recommended that a total of 32,000 square feet of sound-absorbing plaster uh, and tiles be installed on the ceiling and in the side walls, which is what you see here, um, uh, of the chapel. The architects complied, specifying that the ceiling, ceiling vaults be clad uh, in the Guastavino Company's proprietary acoustolith tile. Uh, here's the sweets catalog cut. Uh, and that the walls of the nave be, uh, as, uh, as well as in the transip, transept uh, and the tower, be coated with sabinite, uh, an absorbent acoustical uh, plaster from US gypsum. Not incidentally, however, the design also called for a hard, that, that is non-absorbent plaster in the choir and aisle walls behind the pulpit, as well as behind the organ. So basically around the speaker <clears throat> in the South Gallery, which you see here. Now this detail is significant. Earlier, uh, criteria for auditorium acoustics had focused on the experience of the audience by minimizing reverberation. But by the time Rockefeller Chapel was completed, the criteria had enlarged to include the auditory experience of the speaker as well. In her study of the early 20th century American soundscape, Emily Thompson argues that the engineered dampening of, rever of rever reverberation prior to the advent of electroacoustics yielded a quintessentially modern product, discrete sounds rationalized into serial, serial units. But by 1928, uh, the acoustician Watson, fresh from the experience of the Chicago Chapel, had added the suggestion that the speaker gains, quote, confidence by hearing, quote, the immediate reinforcement of his voice through very rapid reverberation. 
Thompson notices this change but fails uh, to recognize uh, that what was thereby established was, was not or was not only calculated noise-free communication between speaking mouths and listening ears. It was also a short circuit made possible in this case by the calculated absence of sound absorbing materials near the pulpit and the lectern, which localized reverberation around the speaker. Outside this reverberant circuit, the audience, like RCA's Nipper the Dog, uh, ideally heard the speaker's voice as a series of deadened mechanical sounds. While inside the reverberant circuit, the speaker, <coughs> uh, severed from his audience like Nietzsche's professor, heard himself speaking as the sound reverberated around and behind him. The acoustics of Rockefeller Chapel therefore split the speaking voice in two. The serial voice of reason, audible in the pews, and the re reverberant voice of a displaced, sublimated god, a master standing, standing at some modest distance and audible only to himself in a technical diagram that would become axiomatic for academic auditoria and lecture halls until microphones took over. Next, and I can assure you, it works. It feels good, it feels good. All right, tables. Now, in apparent contrast, maybe you're thinking, what about the seminar? Okay, well, the format of the modern research seminar developed out of the intimacy of, of early modern prof professorial tables or student boarding arrangements, like eating, as Ed helped us recognize, collegia and learned societies, mainly in Germany, with deeper roots in seminary like Protestant Convictoria, as well as out of the tutorial system at Oxford and Cambridge. By the early 19th century in Germany, these philologically oriented seminars had proliferated as a primary research environment, uh, along with the scientific laboratory. By and large, retaining the formality of the earlier collegia, uh, the German research seminar was, as William Clark argues, an important vehicle for the reenactment and nurturing of academic charisma uh, through the regular presentation of individually argued papers as dis disputational lessons rather than through informal conversation. By the late 19th century, seminar and laboratory-based research, and Clark makes the connection between these very explicit, uh, has, had begun to predominate in the newly uh, founded and re or reorganized American universities, where it retained what Clark calls its cultic aspects. It was only later that the seminar became a site for training undergraduates in how to read books. When, at the University of Chicago and elsewhere, speaking mouths multiplied and assembled around an infrastructure that doubled up the master's voice into a genial dialogue. In 1921, Columbia University established the, general, the College General Honors Course, a two-year seminar in which advanced undergraduates read a comprehensive selection of canonical works in Western philosophy, literature, and science under the guidance of non-expert tutors led by John Erskine, a professor of uh, English literature. Erskine testifies that he merely wanted, wanted the students, quote, to read great books, the best sellers of ancient times, as, spontaneous, as spontaneously as they would read current, best, current bestsellers at the rate of a book a week. So he wanted to match the, uh, the paperback, uh, or not the paperback, but the, the, the uh, bestseller market. Um, <clears throat> book a week. Uh, but the Columbia General Honors course was, before all else, a list. <clears throat> a dismayed colleague, uh, fearing the end of what he called true scholarship at Columbia College, uh, argued to Erskine that, quote, it is better that a man should get to know 10 authors well in his last two years of college than that he should learn the names of the 84 men presented to him on this list. How are your syllabi doing? Yeah. <laughs> Unlike undergraduate, they still do this at Columbia, you know. It's very good, it's a great, yeah. Yeah, but we invented it. <laughs> Unlike undergraduates at Chicago, those at Columbia were universally male, uh, and it would be decades before the gender and racial uniformity of such lists, in other words, 84 white men, uh, would be openly contested in culture wars. Instead, around 1920, Erskine's lists, and after him, those of his star pupil, uh, the philosopher Mortimer Adler, were mainly <clears throat> reactions against the laissez-faire uh, system of elective courses adopted at Harvard and elsewhere <laughs> around the turn of the century. 
it's true, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay, Erskine, uh, Erskine held the inaugural sem seminar around a large oval table, a, a detail that is generally overlooked uh, in discussions about the formation of literary canons. Seated at this table, the form of which lacked a head, it's oval, right? Um, you can hear marks maybe in the background. Uh, <clears throat> the form of which, uh, were approximately 25 speaking mouths and 25 pairs of ears, plus those of the professors. Professors plural, since in their definitive form, uh, Columbia's general honors sections were taught in pairs. When Mortimer Adler graduated from student to preceptor, right around here, like right there, uh, in, uh, in general honors, his teaching partner was the poet and philosopher of English, Mark Van Doren, who, according to Adler, asked the first question in the first class. This is, here's the question, quote. What is the ruling passion in the Iliad? Van Doren then, quote, went around the table soliciting proposals from every member of the group. Uh, thus showing that with a good opening question, quote, you can call on everyone in rapid succession, and with a w wide variety of answers on the table, you can play one against the other to carry the discussion forward. Failing that, Adler, uh, who's speaking here, Adler advises uh, that, quote, the second leader can correct his partner's failure to understand someone else's response to the last question. Anybody ever team taught? Yeah, it's interesting. So you can correct your partner's failure to understand someone else's response to the last question. Listening with the inner ear to answers is even more difficult than asking good questions. Cultivated amateurism was preferred over, over professional expertise, since, as Adler complained, most professionals teach by telling. Amateurs, among whom Socrates was a paragon, teach by questioning. That's, again, Adler. The seminar therefore trained its teachers into a distinct set of pedagogical techniques. Posing calculated questions, going rapidly around the table, putting responses on the table, listening with the inner ear. To reinforce, to reinforce the dialogic premise, exams were oral rather than written. These techniques worked together to make knowledge that was strictly tabular in character, in two senses. First, such knowledge centered on the seminar table in its primordial oval form at Columbia and in countless cognate forms elsewhere. And then second, uh, it was tabular in that it centered on the list. Moreover, eliciting responses from students around tables required an inner ear sensitive to resonance, pitch, tone, and timbre. Like the speaker here at the lecture podium, but for different reasons, this new form of professor professorial attention was doubled up in the two teachers so that it could listen and learn from its own leading questions. All of which was set into motion by an administrative imagination that fed off of lists meant to replace the book a week lists of modern bestsellers with what Erskine's course called classics of Western civilization. This in order to avoid the stenographic abyss of the lecture in which, as Adler put it, Quote, the notes of the teacher become the notes of the student without passing through the minds of either. So please stop taking notes. All right, well, what seemed a hermeneutic textual exercise, an exercise in the interpretation of texts, was therefore a logistical procedure. In one of several reflexive turns, Adler's most widely read book, uh, work was uh, the 1940 bestseller, How to Read a Book which grew out of the pedagogy he brought to the University of Chicago when the university's new president, Robert Maynard Hutchins, recruited him to join the faculty there in 1929. So Adler was recruited from Columbia to Chicago. Um, at Chicago, Hutchins and Adler reproduced together uh, the, the two-year honors seminar with, uh, on great books based on Erskine's list. The class, which Adler later taught with others, as you see here, was assigned a special room uh, again, with an oval table as a centerpiece and a stage. Within five years, the Adler Hutchins seminar had become a talisman for what was by then known as the Great Books Movement. Here you see the Great Books, of course, you know. Um, <clears throat> which was not, however, without its detractors. The sociologist Edward Schills, for one, regarded Adler as an intransigent bully and remembered hearing Adler for the first time in a seminar discussion on systematic social science, speaking in a domineering tone and slapping the table repeatedly and resoundingly, this is Schills, 
uh, with his palm to add weight to his declarations. And likewise, for the great book seminar, uh, about which um, students were so enthusiastic that Schills wanted to hear what to see for himself. Visiting a class, he encountered, again, quote, as harsh a piece of academic browbeating of a student as I've ever witnessed, <laughs> carried out by Mortimer Adler. Table slapping was as much part of the technique of interpretation of texts as it had been part of the technique of exposition of systematic social science. So, tables. <sighs> well, though the Hutchins-Adler reform suffered a mixed reception in this sense, uh, one notable outcome of the table slapping uh, was indeed the great books of the Western world. A 54-volume collection published by Encyclopedia Britannica and the University of Chicago in 1952, edited by Mortimer Adler and Robert Hutchins. In 1947, Hutchins and William Benton, a former University of Chicago vice president who had become proprietor of Encyclopedia Britannica in a joint venture with the university, established the Great Books Foundation for the purposes of promoting great books reading groups, uh, uh, extramural seminars across the United States adult education in many cases. These seminars were organized and conducted locally around tables in public libraries, schools, colleges, churches, and other public and private settings. By 1953, a nationwide survey conducted by the, by the foundation recorded uh, a total of 1,176 such groups uh, with an average size of 14 participants, which is to say that by the time uh, the great books of the Western world was published, the great books were more, than, were more than a list. They were a system. Now, the great books collection is introduced, this, this series is introduced, uh, or collection, uh, is introduced with, with a volume by Hutchins titled The Great Conversation. Now, although Hutchins strains to define Western society, as he calls it, as progress toward, quote, the civilization of the dialogue, uh, we should read in place of that society the undergraduate honors seminar gathered around an oval table at the University of Chicago. Adler and his co-editor, William Gorman, supplied a two-volume guide to the system. Uh, this is an amazing thing, you, I really recommend. It's called The Great Ideas, a syntopicon of great books of the Western world. Adler's syntopicon tabulates the great conversation subject matter in 102 chapters, each devoted to an alphabet alphabetically listed great idea from angel to world, it goes. He was a specialist in angelology, actually, Adler, yeah, yeah. Um, so so this, uh, these, uh, these chapters, these 102 great ideas that had been inventoried, annotated, and recorded in a building on the, on the Chicago campus nicknamed Index House. Adler's Syntopicon breaks down these 102 great ideas into approximately 3,000 subtopics and 163,000 references, with a range of 284 to 7,065 references per idea, supplemented by an alphabetical inventory of 1,800 terms and indexed to the index by which the reader might locate specific subtopics without having to peruse the entire list. In a, majest in a majestically, manically reflexive gesture, uh, this inventory uh, in the publication, this index, is preceded by an exhaustive 80-page appendix on, quote, the principles and methods of syntopical construction. Thus was the Columbia and, and Chicago Honors Curriculum extrapolated into a system of lists and tables that, more than just recording the voices of dead white men, also elicited speech in a sort of perpetual seminar that was meant to compensate in its intimacy for the abstraction of the lecture, a great conversation. Okay. All right, well, Socratic chatter around seminar tables complete with oral exams is, however, to be distinguished from the recitations and oral examinations endured a century earlier by students like Ralph Waldo Emerson. The seminar, uh, presupposed hours of silent nighttime reading in place of rote oral repetition, and silent reading required light. The electric form of which led, according to Wolfgang Schivelbusch, to a certain disenchantment of the shadowy night. Though not necessarily in the libraries where undergraduates read great books, and where, in the new research universities, professors wrote them. 
1898, two decades before the general honors seminars began, William Halleck, a PhD from Würzburg and associate professor of physics at Columbia University, published a modest article titled, titled oh, keep doing, Diffuse Illumination, Diffused Illumination, uh, in the engineering journal Progressive Age, which was previously known as the Gas Age. So you can imagine where we're going. Right? The article described a new system of ind indirect interior electric lighting uh, devised by Halleck to illuminate the main reading room of the domed library that was the centerpiece of Columbia's new campus, which had opened in the fall of, uh, of 1897. I have to point to my office over here. It's over, it's over here. <clears throat> 1897, okay. Halleck emphasized the desirability for reading of, quote, a mild diffused illumination without glare, without sh sharp shadows. Explaining the physiological benefits of such lighting, Halleck offered a plan for what he called the general illumination of Columbia University Library, achieved by suspending a seven foot diameter opaque sphere painted in a dull white in the center of the rotunda reading room on a nearly, one, uh, nearly invisible quarter inch steel cable. So here you have a sphere and its cable. He described the mysteriously suspended sphere as follows. There it is, sorry. <clears throat> to all appearances, it floats in the air. Even by day, this seeming giant pearl, seen against the dark blue of the interior of the dome, possesses a unique beauty. While at night, uh, eight automatic focusing arc light uh, criterion projectors manufactured, manufactured by the JB Colt Company, the manufacturers of Colt revolvers and early cinema projectors, uh, located on the second floor balconies, you can see one here, um, projected onto it, the sphere, uh, <clears throat> such that, see here's the diagram, right? Balconies, sphere, projectors. Um, such that, quote, the whole sphere seems to glow with a pale diffused light. Again, our physicist waxes poetic. Quote, the effect is beautiful in the extreme. The surface seems translucent and the light seems to come from a certain depth within and to make the whole glow with warm life. And as the ball floats below the ceiling of invisible blue, it is impossible to locate it, whether it is a pearl near us or a moon in the clear blue sky miles away is left to the imagination. A century earlier, Etienne-Louis Boulet had envisioned the combustible sun of enlightenment as a starburst of fireworks in the center of another, even grander dome. In New York, this, that sun became a moon, and Boulet's dramatic architecture of shadows was diffused into a cool, mild light by which to read without excessive strain. Now, in, in actuality, when librarians switched it on at night, Columbia's electric moon only supplemented the incandescent lamps on, re on reading room desks um, that you, you see here. All gone now, of course, if you've been into the space. Um, Halleck, uh, working with the building's architect, Charles Fallon McKim, had designed and made the moon uh, through a series of trial and error experiments, which involved fabricating a large wooden sphere and covering it with different finishes, white paint, tin foil, and even projecting onto its surface a photographic slide of the actual lunar surface. So they projected slides of the moon onto this thing. And it actually, what they discovered, by the way, is that it corrected the optics and it made a better map of the moon uh, astro astronomically. However, uh, um, this particular multi-projector attempt at verisimilitude failed to produce moonlight. The lunar slides were therefore replaced by the unfiltered light uh, of the uh, arc lamp projectors and the surface was painted a dull, dingy white and suspended into place. Now, to what historical processes does the, does the, the diffuse light of this fragile moon uh, bear witness? Until the mid-1890s, gaslight was still the main alternative to daylight in domestic reading rooms and libraries, including uh, that of the most uh, direct antecedent to Columbia's dome. And it actually was excluded from many libraries because it was dangerous, obviously. Um, Thomas Jefferson's library rotunda at the University of Virginia. 
So it must have been that the electrical wiring shown in, the, in, in, in an engraving of the burned out rotunda on the front page of the Richmond Dispatch on October 29th, 1895, it must have been uh, that the wiring that you see here uh, was relatively new. What the Richmond Dispatch called the Calamity of Sunday resulted in the ruination of the rotunda and the loss of about 45,000 of the library's 53,000 volumes. This is one of the things that uh, happens uh, frequently with books they burn. Harvard famously uh, lost many books a long time ago. Uh, a fire had started in, so in the southwest corner of the annex. Uh, a 105 foot long edition at the rear of the library that you see there on the left, uh, that was completed in 1852 by Jefferson's apprentice, Robert Mills. Though the fire's actual cause was never discovered with certainty, uh, initial speculation pointed to the electrical wiring there, uh, used mainly for illumination uh, in the new teaching and research spaces, the engineering labs, basically, uh, in the annex. This is what was in the annex behind the library. The Richmond Dispatch and the, and the University Archives are sprinkled with near immediate reflections on the ruined rotunda's architectural significance, along with calls to rebuild it. Most of these calls exhibit a preference for a reconstruction faithful to the original. Accordingly, in 1896, the University of Virginia uh, engaged McKim, Mead, and White to rebuild, to rebuild Jefferson's library and to add an ensemble of buildings to house a new lecture hall, physics laboratories, and engineering shops and classrooms and also to remove the uh, electric, uh, the power plant of the campus. By this time, Charles, Charles McKim's designs for the Columbia Library, these, were almost complete. And uh, his scheme for, at Virginia expanded the previously modest re reading room, which you see here, uh, from one story to two uh, by eliminating the original mezzanine and running a giant Corinthian order. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, around its periphery that confidently monumentalized uh, emerging American hege hegemony and also borrowed the, or used the same lighting uh, fixtures as uh, Columbia. Thus, uh, the Columbia University Library with its melancholy electric moon was built on the ruins uh, of Jefferson's rotunda, even as that rotunda was being rebuilt by the same architects uh, to resemble Columbia's thereby uh, tracing the symbolic arc of enlightenment from a fiery, luminous dawn to a studious imperial dusk. Okay, well, um, another way of saying this is that accounts of today's corporate university, uh, site of imperial decline, tend to, tend to retrace this arc in which enlightenment's light smolders in the embers of what uh, Bill Reddings elegiacally named in 1997, the university in ruins. Earlier, uh, many thinkers uh, from Gilles Deleuze to Donna Haraway, uh, and many of which were also thinking uh, of the uh, aftermath, in the aftermath of 1968, um, had recognized profound epistemic consequences in the coupling of the university with the corporation, which is only the latest modulation, however, in the hardwiring of power knowledge to capital. Jefferson's rotunda was partly built by enslaved persons. At the other end of the 19th century, Columbia's low library was built in part with money from the China trade. That library's name memorialized the patriarch of a family business, uh, University President Seth Lowe's father, Abiel, As Abiel Abbott Lowe. Now, although A.A. Lowe, A. A. Lowe and Brothers, his, the family business, uh, tea traders, closed in 1887, Columbia University had itself been, been incorporated by royal charter uh, versus King's College since, 19, since 1764. So Columbia was, uh, had been, like many colleges, incorporated uh, much earlier. And indeed, as a corporation, the university was, by the time Lowe Library opened in 1897, a legal person entrusted with the care of its students in loco parentis, a trust that is commemorated by the statue completed by Daniel, Daniel Chester French in 1903 that still commands the steps leading up to the library, alma mater. Dartmouth College, where we began, 
and to which we now return, occupies an inflection point in the history of corporate personhood, which, as you know, is a key feature of, of neoliberal capital. In 1819, as Emerson, uh, Nietzsche's muse, studied classics at Harvard, the same Emerson, by the way, who would later exhort American scholars to leave the library and turn away from what he called the courtly muses of Europe. At the same time, in, in 1819, Daniel Webster uh, represented his alma mater in a landmark case, Dartmouth, in a landmark case before the United States Supreme Court, known as Trustees of Dartmouth College uh, versus Woodward. Like Columbia, Dartmouth had been incorporated in 1769 by royal charter. In 1816, the state of New Hampshire sought to revise the college's charter to render its trustees and president answerable to government. The trustees objected, arguing that this violated the contract clause of the US Constitution, uh, which prevents the state from impairing the obligations of contracts uh, among private individuals or among individuals and the state. The court found that the charter amounted to such a contract, and hence the actions of the state were in violation of this constitutional clause. From there, it was but a few steps to the conclusion that corporations were, in a legal sense, persons, possessed of many, if, if not all, beginning with contractual rights, many, if not all, of the rights and obligations held by their biological or natural counterparts. Most of these steps were taken in the later 19th century, and in, in 1910, uh, in Southern Rail Railway Company versus Green, the court concluded, quote, that a corporation is a person, uh, that a corporation is a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment, which uh, ironically guaranteed the rights of freed slaves, that a corporation is a person uh, is no longer open to discussion. This was our Supreme Court in 1910. Already in 1819, in his closing argument before the Supreme Court, so, almost 100 years before, Webster exclaimed of his alma mater that, quote, it is a small college, and yet there are those who love it. At which point he reportedly choked up, tears filling his eyes. Tactically successful as it was, he won the case, uh, Webster's declaration of familial love uh, for Dartmouth College was genuine, I submit. Not because his apparent spontaneity testified to true feeling rather than calculation, but because, as the court's decision bore out, the corporation called Dartmouth was well on its way to becoming worthy of a singularly human emotion, like love. Around the time that Webster spoke, Dartmouth was indeed, a small, it was indeed small, consisting of about 95 uh, students taught by a handful of faculty overseen by a president and a board of 12 trustees. Its, ca its campus comprised a single uh, building, Dartmouth Hall, uh, which was an early example of the all-purpose, double-loaded, phalanx or phalanstery-like residential and educational uh, halls typical of American colonial colleges. Oh, sorry, I jumped there. Webster's love for Dartmouth had, had likely been consummated, if only in the platonic sense, in that hall, uh, where he lived for three years, uh, and where he and his 30 classmates performed regular recitations of classical verse. That love would likely have, have been further secured in the after hours antics in which he and his cohabitants no doubt indulged, as well as in his enthusiasm for public speaking, which on one occasion included a funeral oration for a classmate. Scattered accounts of college life in the early Republic, Republic, in the early Republic remind us uh, of the relative youth of the exclusively male students like Webster, uh, who was not from a family of great means. They also remind us of the relative lack of discipline that, re that reigned over college life, collegiate life. Probably the most infamous instance of indiscipline, indiscipline during these years is the College of New Jersey's, later Princeton's, Nassau Hall, uh, which had burned in 1802 and was rebuilt shortly thereafter to designs by Benjamin Hen Henry Latrobe. Nassau Hall, which comprised 42 living chambers, some of which were used as recitation rooms, as a, a prayer hall, library, and, a base, and basement kitchen and dining room had all the attributes of Foucault's disciplinary apparatus. Enclosure or confinement, a system of cellular partitioning, distinctly marked functional sites, and ranks, these are all Foucault's categories, 
uh, both ranks, both within rooms, rows of beds, as you see, uh, or desks, uh, and among them by year, ranks by year, and so on. Likewise, class schedules, daily recitations, the teaching of proper handwriting with proper posture, the student pen, paper, chair, desk interface, various prohibitions on time wasting, etc. As you know, uh, Foucault argues that when joined together into a disciplinary system, these properties combine to produce supple, trainable, docile bodies. But the bodies trained in Nassau Hall uh, were hardly docile. On the, contrary, the on, on the contrary, the decade prior to 1820 was punctuated by what President Ashbel Green called every kind of insubordination. During Green's first term, uh, three students were expelled after gunpowder exploded in Nassau Hall. Another was expelled for climbing the belfry and ringing the bell at 3 a.m., while yet another broke into the prayer hall and vandalized a Bible, uh, this is a good one, by, by cutting a deck of playing cards into its leaves. It's a chapter in book history. Um, the following year, 1813 to 1814, saw firecrackers set off in the hall and graffiti scrawled on its walls. Then, on the night of January 9, 1814, in the words of one historian, quote, a cracker consisting of a hollow log charged with two pounds of gunpowder was set off behind the central door of Nassau Hall. So you see the door? Uh, windows shattered, walls cracked, and a piece of the log crashed through the prayer hall door. So you could see, went straight through. Right? The mayhem was especially acute in the building's long hallways before and after evening meals. One evening, uh, President Green performed the duly panoptic ritual of standing outside the refectory with a lit candle. Another meal. <clears throat> he recalls, this is the president, quote, they passed me in perfect silence and respect, but as soon as they had got out of sight, some began the usual yell. Indeed, in Green's diary, um, discipline and indiscipline stand in close proximity. On April 7th, Green wrote, quote, attended examination. We had a cracker in the college today, and in the evening, a company of students in front of the campus behaved in a very improper manner. It was not enough. It was one, uh, if that was not enough, in 1817, students nailed all the building's entry doors shut, shouted rebellion and fire, broke windows, and generally ran amok. Now, fitting neatly as they do into the encompassing grids of Foucault's apparatuses, the acts of indiscipline and of love called forth in the halls of these institutions were also among the conditions necessary for corporate personhood. Not merely, as Foucault would have it, because disciplinary failure inscribed a vicious circle of subjectification, this is Foucault's argument, in which docility and delinquency were two sides of a coin. Not just that, but also, because the apparatus itself directly elicited familial, if not libidinal, affect. A final scene of seduction makes this clear. In 1825, uh, there was a masked, drunken, 14-person riot, on the, uh, as it was called, on the lawn of Thomas Jefferson's recently opened, uh, public but still incorporated, University of Virginia. The following year, a 17-year-old Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe enrolled at the university and took up residence on the lawn, moving shortly thereafter to a room on the Western Range, that's where he lived, in a section known as Rowdy Row. From his perfectly carceral cell, Poe witnessed fights, including the biting of an arm, which led to an expulsion, gambled away what little, little he had, and read classics. Although not himself a troublemaker, Poe was indigent, and he withdrew after only a year, resentful of the wealthier, drunken classmates to whose company he was condemned. A few years later, he eulogized, in the persona of Helen, the beauty of fair Greece and the grandeur of old Rome. Some speculate that Poe's gaze in this ode to antique beauty was still fixed on, on Jefferson's Neo-Palladian, though not exactly Roman, and certainly not Hellenic, uh, campus architecture. But we must remember that its gaze, like that of Bentham's Panopticon, was also fixed upon him. It is, it is therefore tempting to ascribe the near madness that stalked Poe 
uh, and the hallucinatory explosiveness of his writings through the implacable, inversely productive logic of the apparatus, a lifelong rage against the machine. But I want to instead to risk another suggestion, that Poe's Helen is one name for the corporate person whose birth we are witnessing. An apparatus, let's call it classical rather than carceral, shaped by the insubordinate love of those subjected to its iron will, even as it shaped them. Now, in conclusion, then, uh, I, have, I've only, I have to say I've only been able to offer you a few glimpses of the university apparatus as it spills out into the corporate body without organs and folds back in around its folded books. Most of these nested loops belong to the infrastructures of, of industrial capitalism. For universities, like factories, are means of production. But perhaps you also recognize in these loops genealogical antecedents to today's power knowledge couplets. The political theology of the technologically mediated lecture the infantilization of co-workers sitting around oval conference tables, the rekindled light that now, that now emanates from our books rather than falls upon them, and the human capital trained in colleges and universities whose loving devotion is sought and gained by today's corporate persons. Finally, I hope that you will, help, you will have also recognized recognize these loops as links in a chain, a piece of infrastructure that binds its subjects to others elsewhere. Slaves, agricultural workers, miners, dock workers, factory workers, sailors, and laborers around the planet uh, who made the fortunes of those whose names are on our buildings. As well as those women, bearers of literacy, whose domestic labor reorganized the institution of the family 200 years ago, such that the Daniel Websters and the Ralph Waldo Emersons could present themselves before their examiners and say, thus you see me as I am. Thanks. Are you uh, going to? Multi-complimenty. Yeah. Um, we have time uh, for about five minutes of questions, and I'm uh, so we just take them directly from the audience. Is there a microphone, or is it just uh, a cappella? A cappella, <laughs> as it were. That reminded me very much of my experience at Milton Academy. Oh, yeah, yeah well, probably, yeah. <laughs> Not Especially with the alcoves and the hierarchy down in the first class yeah, one and yeah, the first floor. Yeah. yeah, well, that's in a sense where it comes from, yeah. You said that the, this wasn't an architectural history, and in a sense, um, you, ha you offered us these vignettes um, yeah. that we might describe as peri-architectural yeah. aspects of architecture that aren't necessarily at the center of our practice. But, but I wanted to push back against that because I think, um, I, 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 th I mean, if, if you really do think that architecture is a medium that's yeah. in between, sure. um, then there is no central core to architecture, you know, whether it's structure or something. And, and, and so wouldn't, wouldn't this be for, I mean, a new kind of architectural history? You can take that and run with it. Go for it. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, basically, what what uh, I say provocatively, I borrow this phrase from the Chinese authorities, uh, who say capital, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Um, so we could say history with architectural characteristics. Um, and uh, but you know, yes, of course, reverse that as well. Uh, you know, basically, I think we, it, it's time that we grow up and deprovincialize, uh, and and uh, and in in you know um, refuse the the call, which is continuous, to bind the work that we do always to the authority uh, of this this phantasm called a discipline, which is invented. This, this is, of course, the, the one of the many subtexts here. Uh, you know, if you'd like, we can talk about the architecture schools, but. Um, that's what's being invented here. 
this is in, in that sense a history uh, of, you know, when we say discipline and punish, we mean many things, and, and that's one of them. Uh, so, you know, this is what we do as historians and theorists. We, we historicize, but we also um, think about contingency. We think about power and, and, uh, and in this case, knowledge uh, interacting in particular ways. So, so, you know, that would be, in a sense, the most, the most literal translation, I, I think, of your question would be that and to move it into the more directly, explicitly, I, I, you know, the architecture schools uh, and ask uh, about how, you know, analogous... Uh, work is being done there, which it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really like this image that you kind of conjure of, you know, like bratty, coddled um, <laughs> undergrads, didn't make it up. <laughs> undergrads who then become bratty, coddled CEOs, yeah. which is yeah. sort of, <laughs> which is, which is sort of like, I guess, the ultimate um, direction that it's yeah. going, um, and. It, <laughs> It's interesting because it, it does sort of um, remind me a little bit of my own teaching mm -hmm. experiences here as a, as a teaching fellow. Ah, um, excellent. Uh, where, where I realize um, that uh, the power isn't coming from um, necessarily from my mouth at the end of the seminar table, but is actually coming from the other direction. Um, from, the, from where? The students? Either? From the students. Yeah, well, well of course, <laughs> you, you would have recognized that here the argument that the power is coming from the table. Exactly, uh, exactly. So. And, and like, you know, at <laughs> certain <laughs> points, you know, I, you know, I sort of realized that, you know, if I don't give a, you know, certain grade to this person who's been complaining about it, I Google that yeah. person's name and find out, you know, in fact, that person's mother or father sure, has donated. Sure. So, like, <clears throat> could could one kind of rewrite? <laughs> uh, is, so, so I, that's sort of kind of the direction I yeah. sort of see where your um, story is going. Um, is that the kind of coddling? And how to deal with the parents? Coddling. <laughs> Yeah, to some hey, oh, I mean, could would would the story could the story be told like not necessarily from some kind of authorial voice, the authorial voice of the professor, but somehow the end point of your story is actually saying it's the direction of the power is coming from the other direction. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we, surely we we recognize that at any table, power crisscrosses in, in many directions. In a sense, it's what produces uh, the the table and is produced by it, but. Um, I, I wouldn't limit it to, to just, in a sense, um, denominating power uh, in, in terms of, let's say, the passive-aggressive behavior of, of a student, uh, or, conversely, uh, the authoritarian or uh, authoritarian uh, passive-aggressive behavior of, of a teacher. Um, in a sense, that's the, the, one, of the, one of the potentials of, uh, of a media theoretical um, perspective is, uh, is, is to put subjects and objects uh, in, in relation such that it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference. So, so you know, and that's, you know, how persons show up here. In other words, uh, if, you, if I say to you, take what I say literally all the time, uh, media theory, okay, okay, what are the media? Okay, we list a few. Uh, person. So in that situation, it's, it's possible um, that, uh, that both you and your students are subjects of the table. Uh, I don't mean that literally in some functionalist, behavioralist sense. I, I mean it historically in, in the way that I tried to explain of the table apparatus, if to speak like Foucault. Uh, difficult to pin down, to be, to be fair, to be honest. And there are lots of questions that could be asked about, about that and tried to signal, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about that particular historical moment in mm -hmm. which your analysis is situated yep. and how you're incorporating the kind of reconstruction of the American subjectivity in, into your now in a kind of media mm -hmm. kind of analysis. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, how? Uh, well, particularly on the questions of race and gender. And, uh, given that this is a time in which it's particularly in an right. educational setting of yeah. integration in yep. some re respect. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very, uh, you know, f there, there are many, many uh, strands, let's say, uh, of this, this question that passed through all this. I should say that this is, uh, 
the usual excuse, it's excerpted from, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and interesting, okay, I'll tell you a story. One of the uh, other excerpts has to do with Tuskegee University, in which, which was set up so that um, uh, emancipated, emancipated enslaved persons could, uh, and their families or descendants, uh, could, um, could uh, build their own uh, sort of knowledge uh, in a kind of hands-on uh, self-help way. Uh, they even so far as to make, build, to, they, they went so far as to, to make the bricks out of which the buildings uh, were made. That's one of the, the, the you know, the sort of facts that, that, that if you, that's kind of running right parallel with the, at least some part of what I'm talking about here, um, that, uh, that constellates here. So, so you know, just leave that. You know, that that fact is over there, and suddenly, and we have, in a sense, the the bourgeois elite, which is basically uh, first generation bourgeois elite for the most part. Maybe second generation in the case of the Low family and the, these folks, um, sort of figuring out power. Uh, this is the moment of, of the first proper formal moment of American imperialism in the in the European sense. Not not you know. Uh, Continental internal imperialism, but 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 you know ventures abroad, uh, and so I think that's what you know what we're, what we're actually seeing. Like in these in these effort, they're not. It's not like somebody sitting around and saying, "How do we deal with the fractures uh, that were not repaired by the Civil War?" On the contrary, that were displaced and, and reproduced in, in during Reconstruction and so on and so forth, um, and. Uh, and, and the, the one thing that I can say is, is that what you see, what I think you see very frequently, is not, uh, as in, the, 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 uh, let's say, a more classical way of understanding what these kinds of institutions, like libraries or universities even, do in the context of state formation, is not an, an, the, the simple consolidation of an enlightened public sphere. In fact, you have many, many counter-public spheres, and you, you know, so if we take that Columbia one as, as a sort of allegorical instance of uh, of a bourgeois public sphere, a la Habermas, etc., uh, then, then immediately that thing, uh, we've, we must recognize the way that that thing is hardwired, not just to the aftermath of slavery in, in the U.S., that, because that's what industrial capital is doing in the North, uh, is, is learning to exploit differently, um, uh, but also to what we now call globalization, uh, the, chi the China trade. So, you know, and, and it seems, I, I suppose I would say that, that, that my effort here uh, is, um, is to articulate, uh, so this is why I give you the Tuskegee example, because actually right now, if I give you that example, it's, it stands apart, but to articulate uh, the, uh, the infrastructural, uh, if you will, connections uh, amongst and between these processes. Um, you know, something like, I mean, something as simple as remem remembering that that UVA was built, uh, you know, by slave labor, um, but that too is itself an entire uh, chapter that many historians are working on. I'm certainly not the only one to say this. So, I think Michael wants a teeny, teeny thing. Yeah, go. Please. Give him a chance. We can be late for dinner. It's okay. <laughs> no, but the the Tuskegee example is fascinating. Yeah, it is. Because, it's amazing. Yeah. Because it's a case where some a group outside the symbolic authority of discipline or corporation um, nevertheless construct with all the artifice of, of construction apparent something that nevertheless itself gains authority and I don't quite yeah. there's something like a bit of a kind of after image of okay <clears throat> an after image of mm -hmm. discipline this is what I want uh -huh. to pursue so you you come right up against making us choose between uh, a kind of um, acceptance of a disciplinary authority and its sort of legacy mm -hmm. um, versus a rejection of that, which it would be uh, I, I don't I don't know what would be the alternative. I mean, someone like Penelope Dean mm -hmm. would say design and the kind of empirical. Um, you know, in, 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 you know, kind of empirical, pragmatic embracing of corporate capitalism yeah. is the is the alternative to a continuation of the of the moribund disciplinary authority yeah. 
of architecture, right? Yeah. And you come close to making us choose that, it seems to me, except the Tuskegee example gives a way of, yeah. of, of not endorsing uh, anti-disciplinary, pragmatic, empirical, you know, empirical uh, em embracing of, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of the, the situation. Yeah. Yeah, it gives us a third way. Somehow. Well, maybe. I, I don't know. Tuskegee, I, I don't, I wouldn't see, for, first of all, Booker T. Washington was not outside. He, that was, that's the whole thing. And, and you have this, so there, there's um, it's a very, it, it's part of this apparatus. Uh, and differently, though, and, and, and certainly that's what power is. It's difference. It's differentials. So, uh, and he, he sought to leverage that in some sense uh, in a particular direction. So, speaking of discipline, so you, you know that, that, so architecture wasn't taught at Tuskegee first, right away, uh, but the students were building the buildings and they were actually designing them. And then later, Robert Taylor, one of the very early African American uh, architectural graduates, came from, down from MIT and basically set up the architecture program. I'm actually interested in the moment before Taylor arrived. Because I think that's the moment of truth in, in the sense that I think you're pointing to. Um, now, I, I, can, I say that I'm, I'm writing this as we, uh, you know, out loud here. I, I, it has, it's the part that isn't developed yet. But, um, but it, you know, I'm, what I'm interested there in f is in following the bricks. Because I think the bricks are doing a certain kind of work. And yes, that work is architectural in a strictly architectural sense, you know, in all the, the, with all the burdens and, and authority and pleasure of, of, of the discipline and whatever name we give it. Um, but those bricks, uh, you know, what do those bricks want to be? Uh, well, <laughs> it's a complicated question. Uh, and, I, you know, at some level they do want to be persons. Uh, and and, and that, but th th that's the thing. is like, it's not that everything is all sealed up and hopelessly in, in, in this machine. On the contrary, I showed you the students. You know, and, and, you know, this is at some level, I hope, you know, we here, you know, 68 is behind. Um, but, uh, but it takes work. It takes, you know, real work to, to uh, I think, uh, to, to uh, not work through, just simply to work out, to understand, to make sense of uh, the, the, the sort of, what I was calling here, the faults. Uh, where just the moment you think that you've stepped aside or outside, you find yourself, uh, but but which is not at all to say that that there's uh, the, you know this thing is uh, is is in a sense it's pro it's our it's our only hope, or or at least one of the very few. It's it this is the, this whole project honestly is really uh, is you know spoken and done in defense of the university, as a, and in even you know in defense of good old enlightenment in in a certain sense. So, uh, but with all the caveats and and necessary. Uh, sort of uh, rejoinder, so, you know. Yeah, um, Ronald, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated the fact that you started with Van Doren's question, what is the passion yes, of the Yes, 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 I know. With Helen, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was for you, Ed. Uh, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. <laughs>